So I'm going to move kind of even more towards the differential privacy end of things. Uh, but uh, first, let me thank my co-authors, Keith Merrill, Sean Merrill. Keith is with Brandeis. Sean is, uh, is a PhD student with me at Purdue. Brandeis and the University, not a DARPA-funded Yes, yes, Brandeis University. This is not a DARPA-funded project. This is actually supported by the US Census Bureau under a cooperative agreement, uh, as is some of the other work we heard about today. So where this started is um, looking at partitioning. And uh, we, we got into this actually in a study where we were looking at various types of privacy mechanisms and running into some problems with them and uh, looked at partitioning the data as a way to get around some of those problems. And the idea, what you'd really like to have is say, hey, we can just take exactly the same mechanism, protect each sub-database, each partition of the data, and still satisfy our same privacy mechanism, our same privacy goal. And so in other words, when can we treat these databases independently and still say we're satisfying our overall goal? So formally, what we talk about is parallel composition. We say a sanitation, sanitization scheme satisfies parallel composition if given disjoint data sets, corresponding outputs, or sanitization of D1 through Dn, satisfies the privacy guarantee of the original scheme. Uh, differential privacy satisfies this. You can see this in Sigmato 9. Uh, paper by McSherry. Uh, Generalization-based k-anonymity, L-diversity, under local recoding satisfies it. But actually, it's not satisfied by generalization-based anonymization under global recoding. Uh, the difference between local and global recoding, if I were to say, OK, instead of age, I'm going to give an age range, I have to do the same thing globally. I can't do it differently for a subset of the data set. Differential privacy also doesn't satisfy this because uh, in work McSherry, Nissim, and Smith, they showed that when you do this, you actually end up with two epsilon. Uh, so you haven't satisfied your same uh, privacy budget. Well, this is kind of interesting. It, it does and it doesn't satisfy. And this led us to some head scratching and, you know, why is this true? Well, if we look at the definitions, you can read these and it doesn't sound all that different. I mean, yes, they'd use terminology, but there are some subtle differences here. McSherry, which said, yes, we do satisfy this, said, let the D sub i be arbitrary disjoint subsets of the input domain. Um, whereas here they say, let D be partitioned into D disjoint regions. Almost sounds the same, but there's a subtle difference there. And the difference is, you know, there's actually a couple things going on here. So, one is, so there's two issues here. One is, and this came out in the paper, this difference of what does it mean to di for differential privacy to defer on a single entry? And if you look at these papers, they defined it in different ways. So we have one notion, which is deletion. You take a database, you, re you remove an item from it, that's a difference of one. Those, those are neighboring databases. And that's easy to see, because if we take this overall, once we've partitioned our data set, we remove one item, it's only coming out of one of those. And then if you go back to the definition of differential privacy, we actually have zero difference in these two. We're getting the same result. We have a difference here, which is bounded by our epsilon. This is our only place we're seeing a difference, and so we get the epsilon result. We satisfy the parallel composition. But there's a second definition which essentially says, 
instead of removing an item, you replace an item. Well, now this database, our mechanism was applied to it and the difference is epsilon. This one's identical. This one's also epsilon. Now we've got our two epsilon bound. And now all of a sudden as we do this parallel composition, we find we're using more and more of our privacy budget. This is not what we would like to have happen. But there's a separate, there's a second issue here, which is even without that difference in the definition, um, okay, so, well, there's a third thing. What if we define this as modifying the value rather than removing, you know, substituting one for another? Well, now that looks like we've only changed one data set. And so we should be at epsilon now. Uh, you know, is this true or isn't? And so that's, this was an interesting challenge here. That last I issue comes down to how you define partitioning a data set. Is it a disjoint data set or have we partitioned the data set? Well, if I partition the data set so that it's partitioned into, uh, you know, real people and cartoons, well, I can't modify the value here without moving this into a different partition. And so that gets us our two epsilon. Whereas if I say these are disjoint data sets, just kind of completely independent of any way of dividing them, well, maybe it makes sense to make such a change. But does it? Is that, I mean, that kind of becomes a very subtle issue there. So what I'm going to start with here is just saying, can we narrow this gap? And the answer is, yes, we, we can. We came up with a, a definition where we are partitioning databases, but in a specific way tried to get as general as we could, basically what we said is we're going to do a pre-processing of the data set that's a random partition. And intuitively this sounds a little bit better because, well, if you're randomly partitioning it, not dependent on what's in the data, well, isn't this just like they were kind of separate to begin with? Well, it's not quite that easy, but you know, that's, that's the idea behind this. Uh, and it's, it actually works for a lot of parallel, it works for th anything that satisfies this parallel composition, such as epsilon differ dif differential privacy under the substitution as well as the deletion definitions. It actually has some advantages in generalization-based anonymization. There are several attacks that we can show if we do this partitioning and independently uh, apply these, the complexity of these attacks goes up. Even though they're attacking kind of smaller subsets of the data, the overall complexity of the attack goes up substantially. Um, and this even gets us in these areas where we have something like global recoding where we don't really satisfy it. It's not really true under the parallel composition, but we're able to show that we get some advantages. So we, we'd actually done this looking at these anonymization techniques for a couple of reasons. One is because we had some techniques that we wanted to evaluate and test that we were running into complexity issues, space complexity issues. We weren't able to get them to work on our practical data set. Uh, second, we were running into problems where these were not working out because of outliers. You'd have an outlier that would just cause the, the generalization to generalize to such a high level in, under global recoding that your data was useless. We thought, okay, we can try this and if we have the outlier ends up going into one partition, we get one useless partition and the others could be good. Uh, what's more, they actually may give us different types of good information. 
So that was, that was kind of one thing we looked at. Uh, but getting back to diff, oh, yeah. Just to understand the definitional patterns. Uh, can you say, clarify a little more the distribution on the, the random partition of the size of the data set into, into the little VIs? And, and also, what, what is the, I mean, we also, the helpful context would be what, um, what is the motivation you have in mind for the partitioning? Okay. Is it, is it for efficiency to be computing on smaller data sets? Like what, what so, are we so there were, as I say, there were two, when we were started this, we were looking at some, evaluating some anonymization techniques. And so one of it turned out to be the computational, the, the complexity, and in particular the space complexity of some of these anonymization techniques was such that we just could not, we, we weren't being successful in scaling up to the data sets we were using. Uh, and a second was this fact that generalization was overgeneralizing uh, in order to protect outliers. And by partitioning, well, you overgeneralize one partition, but maybe you get something useful out of some of the others. So these were initial motivations. Uh, the, the partitioning here is two things. One is you're selecting sizes of partitions. It doesn't have to be equal sizes. Uh, you know, it can be independent. And the second is you're putting, uh, you're putting the elements into the partitions, uh, essentially using a random permutation of the elements and then assigning them to the elements. So a fairly natural view, but uh, you know, across to essentially a uniform distribution of, of your permutations and your partition sizes. Um, so there's also a, a notation. In, so there, sorry. Yeah. I didn't mean to, yeah. <laughs> notation question, which is there's sort of a, a difference between partitioning the domain from the domain of possible data points, you know, saying like, for example, depending on whether or not they're cartoons or, no. or real people or they would depend according to which state they live in. Uh, versus partitioning the data set itself, which is presume, you know, you can and get a partition on the data induced by a partition on the domain, but. Yeah, and right. this is purely partitioning, this, this is, the, the partition has to be done independent of the domain. It's a little clearer here, where, you know, the, the formal definition, hmm. we have a data set, we're choosing a decomposition of the space, and you know, we're choosing a decomposition of the sizes of the space so that basically we have a bin that will hold each a set number and then we are randomly permuting and then assigning things in that randomly permuted order to those bins. So the values of it is this partition is completely independent of any value in the data. And that turns out, that turns out to be necessary for us to get this result. Um, and the idea from this, we then satisfy epsilon differential privacy where our epsilon is the maximum of the epsilons rather than two times the maximum of the epsilons. Uh, so we're, we're back to the McSherry result, but this holds under both the deletion and substitution views. Uh, the, the key idea for how we prove this, intuitively the idea is that the, partition of, the partitions are determined essentially in advance of your thinking about what your substitution is. So, you, you know, because of that, substituting a tuple only affects one partition because that tuple will go to the same partition based on that permutation. Um, and then for partitions where you haven't made a change, well, the, the old and the new database for that partition is the same, therefore the mechanism applied to it uh, gives you the same distribution of results. And so the probability that you get any particular result is the same. It's only the changed partition where you have a difference which is then bounded by your e to the epsilon, and it bounds the total difference uh, 
between these two mechanisms. So, you know, the idea behind it is fairly straightforward, getting the mathematics to kind of come out is a little bit more difficult and uh, we're, we're still kind of revising the paper to try to make it so that it's uh, a, a bit more under, a, a bit easier to follow than the original um, that we worked out. But there's a key insight that came out of this or, or question that came out of it that when we were looking at this, what's the difference between deletion and substitution? And it, we started looking and realizing that we weren't the only place where there seems to be a difference here. So it's a very simple example. Let me take a very simple query. How big is my data set? What is the sensitivity of that query? Well, under substitution, it's zero. There's no change. Under, under deletion, it's one. My size is changed by one. Doesn't that, I mean, I mean this is such a, a simple kind of foolish query. Why, why would you worry about that? But we actually ran into a situation where because of some things we were doing, uh, we wanted to know the size of a data set and said, well, is that a problem? And started scratching our heads over it. Is it a problem? Um, average. You know, again, there's a very subtle difference here. It's not quite the same because of the fact that your, your sizes are different or the same. Uh, amplification was a technique uh, Lee Kardashi and Sue had developed that was defined using deletion. In their proof, they used the deletion model. We've been having a hard time trying to figure out how this works under the substitution model. Which leads us to an interesting question. Is there a difference in the privacy semantics between these two? It's something that in the literature people seem to go back and forth as if it does, just doesn't matter. And I don't know, maybe there's somebody who's already figured this out. I'd love to hear this. But I'm, I'm wondering, is there something here that we need to start thinking about, about what this really means? Uh, because I can tell you, I've talked with some other people who are trying to, uh, in fact, some of our partners working at Census, who've run into this same issue where it's not really clear what this different, whether we've got two different definitions of differential privacy that actually mean something different or whether these are somehow consistent. Ashwin. Is there indeed two different notions of differential privacy? Yeah. Uh, in fact, in one case, so one of them is actually defined on a space of databases that the size of the databases are, is unbounded. And there is a metric distance between databases that uh, you differ, where they differ in one entry. In the other case, you're, you're only defining it on space of databases where the size of the database is a constant. And then you have a metric is like this thing. So, mm -hmm. and in fact, you can show one implies the other and the other does not imply it. So we can talk about this offline. Yeah. yeah. But the, the question is, if, if one implies the other, if, if they imply the same thing. Uh, one implies oh. the other, but the other does not imply it. OK. Right. The deletion version implies the substitution mm -hmm. version, but not the, not the other. So if, if, if. Up, up to the, up to the two in the factor. Two. Right. I guess historically, I can say both definitions were discussed at the time, you know, yeah. I don't know, when we were writing the 2006 paper. And because sort of for all the settings, all the algorithms we could think of, there was essentially no difference, or at least up to, you know, yeah. we were writing asymptotic, you know, asymptotic guarantees, the constants we were ignoring. And so, you know, we made one choice for concreteness and simplicity mm -hmm. and, and uh, other papers made other choices. But I think in the research literature, by and large, or the theory papers, there's go back and forth between the two because in most settings, they end up behaving almost the same mm -hmm. way. And so, you know, if you're just, if you're not, if you don't care about the exact constants, it doesn't change anything. Um, but I think an unfortunate legacy of that is that there's, you know, inconsistency across papers and it means that when you actually sit down to implement it, you do have to choose. And 
saying yeah. there's a necessary clear and, and guidance and about the one that so, makes more sense. So, so what happens, for example, if you, I mean, does sequential composition work if you switch between methods? What exactly is that? Do you, you know, do you have to do something different? Ashwin. Yeah. yeah so there is a more general, uh, general way to think about differential privacy that generalizes both of these notions. Mm -hmm. And so for that general notion, basically you can define it as, uh, you can define neighboring databases by any metric over, over, over databases. So for all of, for all of those definitions, sequential composition automatically works. For any single instance of that, you can also define sequential composition across multiple instances of that to reference this framework and so on. And I think, I think this is something we need to, as a community, uh, start to work out what's the best way to present this and, and explain this in ways for practitioners to, to make use of it. Because I think we, we still don't have, we, we still don't have that. We have people in the practitioner community trying to use this and don't see these issues, don't realize these issues are here, and aren't sure how to deal with them. And, uh, or, you know, worse yet, aren't even aware there's an issue and, and just don't deal with it. And uh, I think some clean way where we can explain the privacy semantics and, and what this means and, and tell people what you can use and how you can compose techniques is, uh, is something we should be thinking about as, as a community. Um, okay. A couple other, well, I, I really wasn't going to go much into this. This is just some examples of, of the global versus local recoding and the applying this to anonymization techniques, to generalization-based anonymization techniques. Uh, you know, the, the idea is that you may get things that anonymize in different ways in your different partitions. So for example, here we generalize geography more, here we generalize age more. Uh, this gives you some added benefit. Uh, you know, if you're concerned about uh, things at a finer level of geography, at least you have a subset of the data on which you can get some sort of an answer. Now this may not, with a, from a differential privacy point of view, this is not a big deal because, hey, you know, your partitioning is not going to give you additional utility over asking the query with a smaller privacy budget on the larger subset. But, uh, you know, it does have some advantages here. It also has some advantages to these, uh, these anonymization techniques of increasing the difficulty of several types of attacks because now the um, kind of the number of poss a lot of these operate over a possible worlds model and the number of possible worlds goes up dramatically based on because of the possibility of these different random partitions and uh, drives up the complexity of these attacks. Um, so anyway, just some of the things we're still working on this, um, in this space of, of partition pro preprocessing. Can we get closer to saying this is, is close to an optimal use of the privacy budget? In particular, can we use the noise that's inherent in that random partition to satisfy dif differential privacy. And for epsilon delta differential privacy, yes. Uh, for epsilon differential privacy, that's a hard one. Uh, what other operational value is this? Uh, for example, is the fact that you give people subsets of the data and a separate privacy budget, is there an operational advantage to that over saying we have a single database with a single privacy budget? And um, you know, can we use this sampling idea in other ways to improve on privacy budget? So these are just a few things we're still working on. Anyway, I'd uh, like to thank you for this. Uh, like I said, it's, uh, there, there's, I think there's a lot of things where within differential privacy, uh, getting this out to practitioners, there's, there's things we need to better explain and 
uh, making progress there and look forward to more conversations. <laughs>